America, unfortunately, the schools are, are failing us. We find in a lot of our public schools more emphasis on teaching critical race theory than we had on teaching critical math theory. It was the decision of a father first. I'll be damned if I don't do something for my kids. A lot of families started homeschooling way back when to get away from people like me. The people that you have to work with are also the people who crush you. Did you know that there was this kind of homeschool lobby before you introduced this legislation? Uh, I wasn't aware of the grips that they really have on the legislature. The homeschooling movement is extraordinarily influential. Homeschooling exists because of freedom, but that, that freedom is constantly being attempted to be eroded. You're a powerful group. I think we are. Why do you think that is? Because we know our rights. the hair cupcake head it's <laughs> down by the water that's gonna be a fun day at the lake all right let's see who can find the smoothest rock oh yeah shoot you already got it can anybody tell me what a verb is Torsten? you know the a place that's a noun so a verb is an action word okay so this week we're gonna add the ing to an action oh, word to show that it's happening right now so our first oh, spelling yeah. word is are you ready, Charlie? First one, number one is willing. Dude, look, you gotta cast out there, man. So we're out at a lake outside of Redding, California, and this is a school morning for these kids, but they're not technically in school. They're actually a bunch of homeschoolers. It wasn't long ago that homeschooling was rare, just 3% of students. Come closer so I can get you wet. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> 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 then the pandemic happened. No, don't trust that one. We're not trusting any of those branches. Most kids spent months on screens learning virtually, but some ended up in places like this. We are a school without being a school, so we just double down on academics. So from paddling to wilderness survival to literature, it takes all of these dynamics to raise up and unleash your powerful child. Then we got kindergarten here. We're just peeking in. Ryan Spitz started the California Adventure Academy in the fall of 2020. Good job, guys. Kids split their time between outdoor activities and academics, using space Spitz rented from a local church. Like Self-defense week, we did boxing, jiu-jitsu, karate stuff. He doesn't have a background in education. He used to run an adventure tourism company before it was wiped out by the pandemic. Ooh! <laughs> All these kids are registered homeschoolers. Families file paperwork with the state of California, then drop them off here. What are they learning right now, do you think? So right now it's more just creative play. Um, so we got some kids that are doing some sandcastle stuff, others spraying each other with water. <laughs> Healthy conflict. Some come just for the activities, but lots of kids pay around $800 a month and do all their learning. Uh, do you have any ideas how to cast partner? In the first school year after the pandemic, homeschoolers in the U.S. doubled. And even though schools are now mostly back to normal, a lot of the new homeschoolers didn't go back. Last year, in states that track this data, the number of homeschoolers was still up an average of more than 50%. What's this like compared to your last school? I like it a lot more because we do a lot more like adventures, we go outside more. We've actually learned how to fish a lot, most little kids like kindergartners and first. Yeah, and we've also done like, say if you get a wound, how do you fix it? Yeah. Do you know why you started coming to school here? Uh, yeah, because at my other school they made you wear masks. They made you wear masks all the time. So what was that, that was important to your family? Yeah. Ah, three. It started as COVID and then moved beyond COVID. Um, but the initial drivers were, you know, from the social distancing, from the masking, from sitting behind plexiglass. We're now 
this, these kids and my son are starting to fear their bodies, can't trust their bodies, fearing other people. And then quickly realized there were a lot of other people in our in our shoes that kind of felt the same. How many kids did you start with? So started with 44 kids, then we grew to over 200. What does that growth say to you? What we've been doing is not working. I think from a society standpoint, we're kind of have seen to a degree we're reaping what we've sown. <laughs> New homeschooling models like this create an almost parallel structure to the public school system, but without the regulations. Rules vary from state to state. California recommends homeschoolers study subjects they'd get in the public schools, but there's not actually any required curriculum or testing. We start halfway down here. Spitz doesn't even need a license to offer these classes. His teachers, or what he calls guides, don't have to be credentialed. They just have to be, quote, capable of teaching. Stop with a page 22, can you get there? All that's actually required is that someone track attendance, what was taught, and who taught it. Is this like a fancy loophole, like to get around being effectively a school? <laughs> yeah. Like, have you created effectively a school? So I've created a new category of a, a really strong support function to homeschool families. At the end of the day, it's the parent's choice to what they want to opt in and opt out of. So I think that's where it's now on the homeschool front, it's kind of parents taking back control over their, over their children. All right. The surge in homeschooling went hand in hand with a bigger shift, dismantling the idea of public school as a public good. I would never put them in a mass because their brain needs oxygen to grow. Public education quickly became the backdrop for some of America's most explosive fights. Figure it out or get off the podium. The idea of allowing transgenders full access to any bathroom of their choice is just foolish. My nine-year-old does not need to know about segregation. It's unconstitutional for the state to take control of my child's education. The mandates from COVID like lit the fire of, I think, a lot of the mama bears out there. So that kind of awoken the beast holistically of, okay, well, now let's start looking a little bit closer at what is going on when my kid, when I drop off my kid. What do you feel like they're being forced to teach or forced to do in the schools that you object to? Yeah, I mean, I think the, ma the mandates were one of the, the biggest ones. Um, and then I just, I think now then when it comes to the sex ed or critical race theory or just some others, it doesn't seem as intentional or pure on, on how we're raising the kids. Dee Dee, do you want to start ushering them all over this way? Okay. I think the type of content on what they're teaching about sex or anal sex, that my third grade daughter should not be in a classroom where a teacher or someone else is teaching her about that. And that was your experience in school? I threw, threw friends in other spots that had been kids at those ages, because mine was only in first grade when we pulled them. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do Adventure Fest in three, two, one. Oh, we can do even better than that. Adventure Fest in three, two, one. That's perfect, very good. I've never been a politics guy. That's never been my passion. It was the decision of a father first. On, I was like, I'll be damned if I don't do something for my kids. And then that's now what has just kind of cascaded everything else. You felt like, got like radicalized. Yep, and then again from doing that, it's now entered the formal education space. Yeah. It's entered the homeschool space. It's now entering the political space. Can I get an adventure fist from you guys? at the biggest homeschool conference in the country. There's hundreds of booths, everything from swords to lobbyists to textbooks. So we're just gonna walk around and meet some homeschoolers. It's just air? It's just air. Who is God's son? Jesus. Yes, I'll take one of these. The homeschoolers mantra that parents should have the power, not the government 
has become a core part of the right's political platform, which was on full display at the Florida Parent Educators Association's convention. Why are you guys here? So Florida Moms for America is here because we want to raise the next generation of people. Can you talk about the connection between, you know, politics and homeschooling and, and how you see those worlds overlapping? So people homeschool for faith-based reasons and people also homeschool because they don't want their children to get indoctrinated or engaged with certain things. We are just for parents' rights. We monitor the books in the libraries at the schools. We attend the school board meetings. Mm -hmm. We look at the school's budgets, anything that has to do with our children. What's the connection and the overlap with the homeschool community? So the homeschool community, uh, the, the overlap there is, even though they homeschool their children, they still care what goes on in the public schools. Mm -hmm. You know, my children are grown, but I still care what goes on in our schools. Um, those kids are our future. Homeschooling is, is important because right now in America, unfortunately, the schools are, are failing us, the public schools, and especially when they got locked down with the COVID situation, they were able to see the curriculums of what the children were learning, and they felt that it just was not appropriate. Lord, and we just want to ask you for your mercy. We need your help, Father. This is an enormous task in a world that is upside down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here, homeschooling is the common denominator, the jumping off point that unites COVID-denying doctors. This is all a big, giant medical game that they're playing with our minds and our society. Election-denying activists. Something is attempting to take over our country and force us from our constitution. I won't go into that. That's my pet peeve at the moment, the whole election day. And parents who see themselves on the front lines of a battle over the soul of the country. The government has plowed through everyone else, and now we have to shield our children. Their fight has also attracted some more famous conservatives. Please help me welcome Dr. Big Carson. We need to recognize that political correctness, which has morphed into wokeness, is antithetical to the principle of liberty and freedom of speech. And, and I'm very glad to see alternatives because we find in a lot of our public schools more emphasis on teaching critical race theory than we had on teaching critical math theory. The homeschooling community wasn't always this strong. Our children belong to our families. Our children are the most important single thing. Most states historically treated homeschool like no school. Parents trying to do it ran into lots of legal problems. There are some school districts that tend to be hostile and not want to give information to parents. And there's a Homeschool Legal Defense Association that website is correct, as, that, well, as well. But in the 80s, a small group of lawyers got together to change that. This commission was created by executive order. They created the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, or HSLDA. I think the ultimate form of privatization of education, that is homeschooling. The co-founder was Michael Ferris, a homeschool dad who was president of the group for almost 20 years before going on to become one of the country's most influential right-wing lawyers. Homeschooling is still considered illegal uh, in most states. If we're going to have educational innovation, we've got to allow for it, first of all, to exist legally without parents feeling that they're going to be prosecuted. For the past five years, he's run the Alliance Defending Freedom. I'm Michael Ferris. I'm the president and general counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom. ADF is a conservative powerhouse, successfully suing to eliminate vaccine mandates, fighting to ban transgender athletes in school sports, and helping build the legal case that eventually overturned Roe v. Wade. Ferris may have moved on to higher profile causes, but he'll always be tied to the HSLDA. He's still chairman of its board. If we don't have people who believe the principles of freedom, we won't be a free nation. And his legacy lives on at Generation Joshua, the youth program he founded in 2003. The House will come to order. We're currently on consideration of H.R. 66. I do believe that there is pieces that are missing, like how we're going to govern this colony and really what we're going to do with it. We're moving to DEFCON level two because 
we feel very much threatened. We're getting close to a third world war. There are no auditory things right here. This is a voting booth. You cannot influence votes here. You also cannot influence votes within these pillars. You must be outside if you want to talk to anyone. That is literally federal law. So. So this is Generation Joshua. It was founded by the HSLDA as like the youth division to train the future Christian leaders of America. This week they've set up a political simulation. So these teenagers who are pretty much all homeschoolers are practicing how to run the different branches of government through the State Department, the Department of Defense, and we're gonna go check out one of their strategy sessions. I just wanted to show some introductions around here real quick. So can I interrupt for a second? Yes, sir. All right, so quick thing. Press Secretary for Intelligence is here. The CIA, who's in charge of the CIA now? I'm so sorry. Okay, fair enough. You do realize the FBI is watching you. Good, okay. Good. I do now. Now you do. And then we have the Defense Intelligence Agency, and we have the National Security Agency. Joel Gruy, who was homeschooled and now homeschools his three kids, heads up the whole operation. Generation Joshua has local chapters across the country and runs small intensive leadership camps like this throughout the year. If someone set this up and the end result was people died, it's yeah. no longer arson, it's murder. Okay, that, right? that's, that's okay. a good thing. At least I think so. Yeah. Prosecution can tell you more. Does that escalate the punishment? It should. So how many kids are here this week? About 100, give or take. Usually we'll have a couple hundred come through over the course of the summer. And how many camps are you running like this during the year? Normally three or four. We've had about 30,000 kids come through the whole program over the course of the last 15 or so years. What's in here? This is defense. So, come on in. Hey, how you doing? Those are other countries' yeah. missiles? Not missiles. Oh. Um, but ballistic launch capacity. Oh, and you have the nuclear launch code? Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? Generation Joshua, at least in part, was designed to make sure that each generation of homeschool students understood the basic skills for uh, political activism, policy, governance, how it works, how they can get involved. Um, partly, it was originally done, done to say, hey, here is how we defend the, those hard-fought freedoms. Why is it so important for homeschoolers, specifically, to do a program like this? Well, I think it comes back to that idea of freedom. But that freedom is constantly being attempted to be eroded in different ways. Generation Joshua says, here's, at least in part, here's how freedom is kept and, and won and held and defended, and here's how you, as a citizen, make your voice heard, no matter what you go and do. Why is that aligned? With to the, right. the GOP, yeah, and the, and the more Republican side I of don't things. think, so for example, for us, we would say that we are not partisan, but we are principled. Of the two political parties, the GOP has been traditionally more favorable to homeschool freedom. Generation Joshua's simulation has all the trappings of a real government, even a campaign for the presidency. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and play the first campaign ad. Protecting our veterans, defending the unborn lives, and standing up for American businesses. For we are going to continue to fight for the rights of the unborn. The president and vice president. As I was running for the president, my my motto, my. Uh, my campaign slogan was to refine the homeland, essentially to fix our education system, make sure that our kids are being taught good things, that it can help our country grow and be uh, a stronger country altogether. What do people say about education here? What, um, what are the big topics? So uh, big topics are just like the idea that curriculum would be decided by the government at the top for every single school. Uh, there, I saw a lot of bills and a lot of people arguing that we should have like parents be able to decide and like vote on what curricula were being taught in the specific school in their district. Like what kinds of things? Uh, things like uh, critical race theory, things like the 1619 Project, or just the idea that in a lot of schools across America, even like middle schools and sometimes elementary schools, there's like graphic or sexual content that's discussed. And I think that that's something that a lot of people I should get fired up about and we should definitely take care of. These talking points are almost verbatim what you'd hear from today's GOP. And that's the point. Part of Generation Joshua is about bringing what kids learn here into the real world. Every election cycle, the organization picks politicians who support its mission, almost exclusively Republicans, and deploys homeschoolers to help them win. What we do is we'll say, hey, let's look at races that are, that are swing right, where a handful of people can come in and they can invest their time. The advantage to us on a practical level is that we were able to advance and encourage you know, pro-freedom, pro-family, uh, pro-homeschooling candidates. Does this make this group kind of a political secret weapon for some of these campaigns? I don't think it's a secret. Um, 
But it is effective, and it is different. They tend to work pretty hard when they do it, and all of that makes them very, had to have a high impact. The campaigns recognize that. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Amber Johnston is a homeschool mom of four and started a co-op for black homeschoolers six years ago. Since the pandemic started, it swelled to 260 kids. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Black families are one of homeschooling's fastest growing segments. In the last two years, their numbers rose by 500 percent. But they don't always see themselves represented among the movement's major players. What do you hear on kind of the main stage of homeschooling that's alienating to families like you and the ones that you work with? Anytime you say the word black, or if you write about something needing to be inclusive, they're like, oh, no, here they are coming over here being woke, all that critical race theory stuff. And and I'm just like, I just want my kids to have some books with black people in them. The people that are giving us the hardest time on paper, if they, you were to write down the description of them, aside from being white, you would also be often describing me. And I have to remember that a lot of families started homeschooling way back when to get away from people like me. In biblical stories, the artists typically make people look like what? Themselves. They typically make people look like themselves. If a black person did this, it would make them Black. Oftentimes, no, black artists no, no, no. do you depict the biblical stories as, Wait, as black people. Bible. We've seen homeschooling really rise since the start of the pandemic, and a lot of black families are sticking with it at higher rates. Why do you think that's happening? There was a feeling of seeing that maybe we hadn't come as far as some of us thought we had, and a fear of like kind of not wanting to put my child in an environment where now I see what people really do think of them. The thought that someone would look at my children and feel that they're less than is crushing. I felt like if there was a way to avoid that, a way that I could protect them for as long as possible, then that's what I wanted to do. And I think that that's what I heard from other parents. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started, guys. The history curriculum centers the experiences of people of color in the United States in American history. So it's going to be black, indigenous, and some um, also Latina, Latino. I had already been homeschooling for years when COVID hit, but this is what other parents were telling me. They're like, I can't do it. Like, I can't, I can't take them back. It was almost like a, a desperation. When you outline what's appealing to you about homeschooling, on paper, it's exactly the same as what someone who might be on the complete right wing end of the spectrum is also saying. The system is broken. Now, the issue is we don't agree on how to fix it, but we actually all agree that it's broken. It's, it's similar to homeschooling. Whenever there's a threat in any particular state to their right to homeschool, oh, you will see us come together. You know, it may not, we're not gonna stay together, but we will band up because we all desperately need our right to homeschool. What is your relationship as a homeschooler with the HSLDA? My family is a member of the group, which basically means like if there was a knock at the door or some type of challenge to our ability to homeschool, like you can call them and they'll represent you free of charge. And that's the nuanced aspect of being in the homeschool world. The people that you have to work with in order to maintain what you hold dear are also the people who crush you. We've been protecting and equipping homeschool families for more than 35 years. Johnston's one of more than 100,000 families who pay annual fees of about $130 for that kind of support. Between memberships and donations, the HSLDA has brought in as much as $13 million a year, money it uses to protect families from restrictions on their ability to homeschool. We'll send letters, make calls, and even represent you in court. Over the past few decades, the HSLDA has helped make it easier to homeschool across the country. Today, 16 states have no curriculum requirements, 32 states have no mandatory testing, and in 12 states, parents don't even have to notify officials when they pull their kid out of school. 
The HSLDA's fundamental opposition to regulation means its activism extends well beyond homeschooling itself. It's opposed vaccine requirements, unionization efforts, even same-sex marriage, and has recently supported a slew of parents' rights bills. When the HSLDA picks up a cause, it can torpedo legislation with a single call to action, even when it doesn't seem like the kind of bill a group supporting children would be opposed to. This happened in 2018, when a teacher in West Virginia reported an eight-year-old student named Rayleigh Browning was showing signs of abuse. Child Protective Services launched an investigation, but then her dad pulled her out and registered her as a homeschooler. Rayleigh died at a local hospital the day after Christmas 2018. Two nurses testified the eight-year-old had scabs and bruising on her body. Her leg showed a burn mark. Judge Blake and Special Prosecutor Brian Parsons say homeschooling played a role in the victim's death. After she died, state delegate Sean Flaherty introduced a bill called Rayleigh's Law, which would block students from being homeschooled if their parents or guardians are suspected or have been convicted of child abuse. The idea that on the one end in public schools, we have mandatory reporting, but that we can get around this through just simply being a homeschooler. That should have some sort of parameters in place and protections in place. Did you think it would be controversial? No, no not at all. What reaction did you get? The reaction I received was uh, that certain people felt that it was some sort of an attack on homeschooling and not an attack on people who abuse children. I actually had people show up to my office. Well, we had pushback from uh, the homeschool groups in West Virginia. Some national groups stepped in as well. I would get kind of boilerplate emails, which tips you off as a legislator that there's a coordinated effort going on. There are groups, I wanna say there's like this homeschool defense fund group that came out against Rayleigh's Law. The HSLDA. That's it. And there were quotes about how awful this bill was and it's an attack on homeschooling. And, you know, they want to move the, the goalposts. That's what you do in politics. But I always thought maybe protecting children, you wouldn't actually go about that. What's the status? Sitting in committee for who knows how long until the chairman decides it's worthy of his time. And that's because he wants to do what the homeschoolers want to do, not necessarily what's in the best interest of all children in West Virginia. Did you know that there was this kind of homeschool lobby before you introduced this legislation? I was aware of the lobby. Uh, I wasn't aware of the grips that they really have on the legislature. What they have is a grip on the education system in West Virginia. They have a grip on legislation and how it moves. They control the education committees in both the House and the Senate. What effect does this amount of control have on the public education system? Well, public education is not a priority in the sense of public education. I mean, things for homeschooling, we just passed out legislation for pod schools. So you have all these domino effect pieces of legislation. And then what, what's on the back burner? Public education itself. just walking around introducing myself. I'm Kathy Hess Krause. Yeah. I'm running for House. Right. I'm the current delegate. Are you running independent or? I am Republican. Republican. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the woman who led the charge to block Rayleigh's law now sits in the House of Delegates alongside Fluority. Well, I can tell you when it comes to pro-life, I voted against exceptions. I am Second Amendment all the way. Have mine on me right now. Kathy Hess Krause has spent more than a decade pushing for homeschool-friendly laws, first as an activist and now as a legislator. School choice, I voted for adding micro schools and learning pods this year. I'm a homeschool mom. I haven't tried to teach them what to learn. I've tried to teach them how to learn. So there's things they want to know all the time. And I'm like, I used to tell them all the time, I'm like, well, Google it. I've heard the story over and over again. They're like, once the kids came home, they didn't have all these issues that they were learning in school that I had to turn around and unteach them. Like I said, hopefully I'll be your uh, delegate come, yeah. come November. <laughs> I hope so. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> Krause has homeschooled since the mid 2000s after she alleged her child's teachers were verbally abusive. It was just mommy gut that said something wasn't quite right. Since then, she's been one of West Virginia's most visible HSLDA allies. She ran the state's biggest homeschool advocacy group for years. I always pinch myself. 
out of 1.8 million people in the state. I am one of 100 that helps make the laws. So your homeschool journey led you here to yes. the Capitol? Yes. You're a powerful group. I think we are. And I have seen through the homeschooling community, they're very politically involved, more so than a private school community or the public school community. Why do you think that is? Because we know our rights. Are there any regulations that are good regulations when it comes to homeschooling? Or in a dream world, would there be no restrictions? The school system isn't giving me anything. I don't get any money. I don't get any help. And I don't feel like they should have any control over my children. I left there for a reason. They seem to not care about my kids when they had them. So why should they care about my kids when I'm educating them? Many counties have lost hundreds of kids to homeschooling over the, over the years, especially over the last couple years. What does that do to the schools? The schools just have to adjust. If they want kids, they're gonna to have to earn the ones they get. West Virginia's public schools are struggling. One study ranked the state near the bottom for education, and the latest round of standardized test scores are abysmal. Only about one in four high school juniors were proficient in science. Even fewer were proficient in math. Homeschooling advocates say they're simply responding to a failing system. But pulling kids out and campaigning against schools can come at a very real cost. In 2021, West Virginia's GOP-controlled legislature approved something called the HOPE Scholarship. It would give families $4,300 a year if they pull their kid out of public school and enroll in an alternative, like private, charter, or homeschooling. That money comes straight from what would have gone to the public schools. The HOPE Scholarship was supposed to start at the beginning of the school year, but public school parents sued saying it would violate the right to a quality public education, something the state's constitution guarantees. Morning. Um, I don't think I've seen this many people in the courtroom when we weren't picking a jury. At first, judges agreed. Actually, our public students are losing money twofold. They're losing money from the plaintiff's position, money that's being diverted for use in private institutions and for homeschooling, and also by virtue of the fact that the enrollment, as a result, will decline. That funding source won't be there. Correct, Your Honor. You got a ride home? Yeah. Good. Just checking. But West Virginia's Supreme Court of Appeals heard the Hope Scholarship case this month Good. and ruled Just it checking. constitutional, which means it will go into effect and could pull as much as $13 million from the state's public school budget in its first year. That's a big deal for districts like the one where Tess Jackson teaches seventh grade. Have a good day, Lauren. For some schools, that's going to be things like bus routes. For other buildings, it could be things like how many classrooms we have, how many teachers we can afford, because those are the things that you can control. My building is the size that it is, and it takes the same amount of money to heat it, whether there's 800 kids in it or 200 kids in it. When you hear, let's say, a homeschool family say, I'm gonna take my kid out and pursue this Hope Scholarship because the public schools are failing, what's your reaction to that? I ask them why we don't fix it. Why are we not taking responsibility for a public system that we essentially have complete control over? Are you kind of jumping ship? When you talk about the cuts that could happen, then what happens? There's a whole portion of the kids that I have who don't have an advocate. They don't have a parent or a guardian who is going out of their way to homeschool them or has the privilege of being able to homeschool them. And so when teachers say, we can't lose any more funding, we aren't talking about us. We're talking about those kids that nobody else is gonna advocate for. Um, and they get left behind. Yeah, okay. I shop here all the time. <laughs> Thanks. How would you describe what it's like to be a teacher here? I think teaching anywhere, it's a hard thing to do. So for example, my birthday was last week. Um, and on my birthday, my husband and son took me to the mall and 
I was excited to be at the mall and we went to the bookstore and I picked up a couple of books for me that are like newish books, so they were kind of expensive. And I was like, well, hold on just a second. I should look and see if they have any books for my kids because I do choice reading in my class where my kids get to pick their books. And I put back the books for me um, to buy books for my kids. So it can be, it's a balancing act, I think of uh, knowing what knowing what your kids need and spending your own salary to get it. Though many homeschool families support the Hope Scholarship, the HSLDA doesn't actually endorse it. It's so opposed to any sort of government involvement, it even rejects its funding. But the organization remains aggressively focused on making it easier for families to take their kids out of the public school system. Is the HSLDA the most powerful lobby group that people haven't heard of? I would say that the homeschooling movement as a whole is extraordinarily influential. And we play a role in that, but um, because people who homeschool care passionately about what they, what they do and they want to preserve their liberties, it doesn't take a lot for us to mobilize them. Why does HSLDA get involved with causes that are not directly about homeschooling? Can you give me an example of what you're referring to? Yeah, I mean, there's been some bills that were about union organizing. There was a bill about banning gay conversion therapy that HSLDA came out against. Well, oftentimes, you know, we'll we'll, uh, examine a bill and um, if it has kind of downstream effects that would affect parental rights or homeschooling, um, we'll take a position on it. What, What would some examples be of downstream consequences that people might not immediately recognize? Um, yeah, I'm not coming up with anything. Sorry. One case in West Virginia that got a lot of attention, it's called Rayleigh's Law. Why would the HSLDA oppose regulation that ostensibly is to prevent children from being in, in an abusive situation? We, we weep uh, whenever children are abused, just like anyone else. Um, many of the regulations that are proposed wouldn't change things. So in this example... Um, the, ch- the child was already, you know, subject of an investigation, and somehow that system failed. Uh, but imposing restrictions on homeschooling wouldn't have changed it. I mean, it's it's kind of hard, you know, to explain to someone this bill is to like stop child abuse, and we're against that. <laughs> how does that? How do you reconcile those things? Many of the bills that are proposed would impose enormous restrictions on um, completely innocent people who never do anything, and they often won't actually prevent the harms that they're trying to prevent. How does homeschooling fit into the larger educational landscape from the HSLDA perspective? It's an island of liberty and a sea of compulsion. You know, our, our job as an advocacy organization is to preserve that island of liberty so that parents who want to uh, will always have the option to choose homeschooling. Does public school exist in the ideal landscape? Well, obviously it exists, It's um, and it's enormous. So our job isn't really to fight the public schools on their own ground. It's just to make it possible for people to leave if they want to. What happens when more and more students and families opt out of these systems? Do you think there's any risks to losing that shared space of school? Well, that's a vision of education that goes way back. I don't think there's much of a risk because uh, people form their own communities. Education is not properly a function of the state, and and so we would prefer that parents just have the liberty to homeschool their their children without um, bringing the state money or the state uh, regulations into it. Am I making you a bagel, Co? Or was that to Branson? As homeschooling has grown, public schools have continued to hemorrhage kids. In the last school year, enrollment dropped by around 4 million students, or 9%. Is this like a battleground area, education? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, kind of my weapon of war right now is trying to be a beacon. It's our duty to protect our kids. You brush your teeth, Coco? Oh, you already did? Nice work. What do you think happens when groups separate themselves for education? I mean, it, it definitely 
naturally segregates itself. Public school, just by itself, like, isn't a bad thing. It's, it's more the drivers and the motivators behind it. By my left. Then there's the battlefield of the money follows the child. You know, say each child has a $10,000, $12,000 attachment to them. That whether that now goes to public school, to private school, to charter school, or to you as a homeschool family, you know, that's the place that I think we holistically need to be in. Do you have any concerns about having the funding kind of taken away, like what that leaves the public school environment like? It sucks that out of all of this, our kids are the collateral damage from it. Morning, sir. That financial hardship that it's gonna bring to it, hopefully has a silver lining on it will cause change to really looking at the root of why families are leaving. So you think if the public schools really feel the damage that it will be a good thing in hope, the long run? I hope so, yeah. My hopes would be that that would that would bring some more awareness and a pause to what are we doing from a decision maker standpoint to cause people not to want to be here. Love you. Hi. Good. I'm so glad to see you. Thank you for coming. Do you want them to come up this side of the stage? To the left. As a parent who's chosen to homeschool, do you feel any responsibility towards the impact that that does have on the public schools? Yeah, it's the type of thing that keeps you up at night, right? But then you you also look at your your children and you're like, well, what do I do? Please stand for the processional of our graduates. Let's give them a round of applause to these young people who have worked hard in their homeschool work this year. Words cannot express how grateful we are for you and all that you have poured into this community of homeschool families. The public school system is broken. I don't want to separate myself from that or pull away, but I also don't want my children to be martyrs. I don't want to experiment with them while our nation struggles to figure out what the heck it's doing. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.